uh, my talk would be about the management of recurrent, uh, recurrent urinary tract infection in children. Uh, unfortunately, I have uh, no financial disclosures. Um, as uh, a start, I don't hate antibiotics, but I don't like them either. Uh, the objectives of my talk uh, would be uh, to provide an overview of uh, current and practical concept in recurrent urine tract infections in the pediatric population, and it is geared uh, to the clinical interest of the pediatrician. Uh, so what is the importance and why we are discussing this topic? Uh, why are, uh, are pediatric urine tract recurrent infections important? As you can see from this graph, uh, as the number of urinary tract infections accumulate, there is an increased risk of renal scarring. And the sequel of renal scarring would uh, be a decreased uh, renal function. Uh, so if you see, uh, if a kid has uh, one urine tract infection, they are at the risk around 5% of having renal scarring. And this risk increases with subsequent infections and uh, the slope actually takes a more steep uh, rise after the third infection. And with five urinary tract infections, we expect around 60% of kids will have uh, renal scarring. So uh, the, the key message here is that the risk of scarring increases with the frequency of recurrence. So if you look into this picture, and this uh, uh, depicts all kids that will get urine tract infections. And uh, maybe those are the kids that have urine tract infections with uh, vesicoureteral reflux. And maybe a lesser subset of those kids will uh, have subsequent scarring. And maybe this only unfortunate kid will be uh, 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 at the risk of having reflux nephropathy and subsequent renal failure. So our duty as clinicians is to uh, know which child is at this risk and hence the importance of risk stratification. So recurrent urinary tract infections in, uh, in children has a significant cost burden. One of the studies published in the Journal of Pediatric Urology has estimated around half a billion uh, US dollars in 2011, increasing every year with an 18% increase in cost burden per year. So it's not a, a small problem financially uh, on, uh, on healthcare providers. But first, it is very important to establish the diagnosis and ask ourselves, is it really a UTI? Uh, this study actually shows that the risk of contamination in more than a thousand children using different urine collection methods warns us that utilizing a bad specimen, a bag specimen to get the urine, uh, the urine uh, analysis and culture harbors a 43% of contamination as opposed to 9% when you do a suprapubic aspirated specimen and 14% when you do a urethral catheter specimen. So it's very important to dismiss any uh, specimen or any result coming uh, from a bag urine. As a matter of fact, I, do, I disregard treating kids with a bad specimen. And unfortunately, it seems to be a somewhat widespread practice among some clinicians. Uh, one of the main risk factors of uh, urine tract infection and recurrent urine tract infection is the circumcision status. As you can see, uncircumcised kids have a higher risk of uh, urine tract infection as opposed uh, to circumcised kids. And, uh, uh, in many places of the world, particularly the Arab world, due to religious uh, uh, obligation, the majority of kids are being circumcised. However, if you look worldwide, uh, there is a fading away of uh, uh, neonatal circumcision, and some parents, for many reasons, 
cultural or personal are refraining from uh, circumcising their kids, and this might increase the risk of uh, urinary tract infections. The female gender itself is a risk of urinary tract infection. And if you see in this uh, uh, box, you can see that a girl or a female has a lifetime risk of around 53% uh, to have a urinary tract infection as opposed to boys. Uh, males are probably at a higher risk of infections uh, during early life, in the first one to two years of life before toilet training, and later in life uh, after they have prostatic hyperplasia and infections related to that. However, females, and more so after adolescence and uh, uh, early adult life when they are sexually active, have an increased risk of uh, recurrent urinary infections. So on physical examination, which is very important to assess the genitalia of your uh, pediatric patients, is to look for many clues in, in physical uh, exam. For example, at this a uh, picture shows a rather common finding of labial adhesions, as well as uh, not so much uh, hygienic introitus. And uh, this labial adhesion forms like a pocket and uh, leads to stasis of urine, which predisposes this girl uh, for uh, in recurrent infections. And it is very important to manage those uh, labial adhesions immediately I usually apply some local EMLA cream and then with, with gentle traction, you can easily uh, spread those adhesions. More so, there are many other findings uh, in physical examination to look for. For example, the first picture uh, shows a child with buried penis and a phimosis uh, leading uh, to increased risk of stasis and uh, infections. The other picture shows a, a, a prolapsed urethrocele protruding from the introitus of a girl. The third picture shows an ectopic urethral insertion uh, that could be uh, catheterized in the clinic. And it's very important also, and your physical exam is not complete before you do physical examination of the lower back of the child, because you could see uh, some findings that can suggest spinal dysrephism, like this patient that has deviation of the gluteal fold. You can see tuft of hair, you can see a sacral dimple, uh, skin tags that can uh, raise the suspicion of spina bifida occulta or unmanaged uh, uh, spina bifida uh, spectrum that will lead to neurogenic bladder and increased risk of urine tract infections. Uh, it's very important also to look for something that is very common in my practice as a pediatric urologist, and it's called this dysfunctional elimination syndrome. I think all of us can relate to this child that holds their urine and start doing the pee dance. And those kids are, we call them the dysfunctional uh, voiders. And basically for many reasons, mainly at school, uh, now with COVID, all of them are at home studying online, but during school times, uh, uh, the uh, strict teachers that uh, do not give bathroom privileges to the shy uh, kids who are afraid, crowdedness at the public toilets, uh, not so much uh, hygienic uh, public toilets, as well as our, uh, I would say, the curse of the modern world where all our kids are busy playing video games and holding their urine all the time. So if you look into this uh, uh, figure, if you look into the bladder, it's filling with the first sensation of voiding, and then it goes to full sensation. And many kids at this point, they just behaviorally uh, do not uh, empty their bladders and they need it to urge. And this leads to filling the bladder under pressure and they don't want to soil themselves and, and uh, uh, have urine accidents. So they squeeze their sphincters and then when they squeeze their sphincters, they will have backup of stools and constipation. And that will have 
subsequent further pressure on the bladder neck. And when they empty their bladders, they will have post void residue. Again, another major risk factor for recurrent urinary infections. So it's very important to objectively assess constipation. <coughs> Many families are unaware that their kids are constipated and to their astonishment, their kids would say, I have never passed a bowel movement in the last two days or three days. So look into, uh, uh, ask them how the, your stools is like and anything that is not type four, mainly type three, two or one, are uh, the stool types that signify constipation. It's very important to look into that in your history. Again, what do our kids like to eat? I bet many of our kids like to eat fast foods and sweets, and they refrain from eating healthy foods and vegetables. And this also makes them uh, more prone to constipation. Now, this dysfunctional elimination syndrome leads to lots and lots of clinical presentations. We're talking about UTIs, but they can also mimic UTIs. So they come to you with dysuria, they come to you with irritative urinary symptoms, but they don't have really a positive urine or a contaminated urine, but they can actually also have true recurrent UTIs. Nocturnal enuresis, secondary reflux, incontinence, retention, testicular pain, uh, fecal soiling, uh, bladder uh, dysfunction, uh, bladder failure, uh, blood on the uh, blood in the urine. So there are lots of uh, clinical presentations to make you uh, 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 raise your suspicion. So dysfunctional voiding and constipation is behavioral, and it can be a lifestyle, and it needs. Uh, a tremendous uh, effort in reversing that with lifestyle modification. Now, a word about vesicurator reflux and recurrent UTIs. So, vesicurator reflux is one of the anatomical findings that increases uh, the risk of UTI, and it is associated with UTI. The current recommendation uh, uh, with the American Academy of Pediatrics and other uh, uh, bodies is to investigate for vesicurator reflux with the second confirmed febrile UTI. And the gold standard imaging of UTI is to obtain a micturition uh, cystoerythrogram or avoiding cystoerythrogram. Uh, this is the gold standard. And I want to caution you that VCUG in a toilet trained child, especially a girl, is very traumatizing and we really need to avoid it. There are lots of research on the traumatizing effect of a VCUG with anxiety, fear, distress, and pain. Many uh, support groups are against doing a VCUG, and it is very important to uh, try to avoid doing a VCUG, and if we really need to do it, to provide the proper pain control, sedation, and the ideal setting for the, for the child. So can we maneuver around ordering a VCG in some of our children? Yes, we can. So if you look into the classical way of doing a VCUG, which is the bottoms up approach, that's the usual classical way, is all children with UTI will end up doing an ultrasound and the VCUG. And this way you will probably capture all the kids that will have a VCUG. But the argument is you might be doing extra investigation for the clinically insignificant VCG that will not have any surgical or renal function sequelae on your patients. And for that reason, there has been what was uh, uh, popularized by Rushton, which is the top down approach. So if you have a febrile UTI, don't do a VCG, actually do a dimercaptosaccinic acid uh, renal scan, a DMSA scan, to look for scarring. And this way, you can actually select for your patients that have cortical defects or scarring, and only those patients will end up doing a VCUG. However, those with a DMSA scan will actually, with a normal DMSA scan, will uh, require no further workup and will be managed uh, in, a, in a less invasive way. Many clinicians 
actually order an ultrasound and uh, try to make clinical uh, uh, derivations out of the ultrasound. Uh, I need to caution you that the degree of hydronephrosis on ultrasound is a poor predictor of the degree or the grade of vesicular reflux. You can have any grade of hydronephrosis with any grade of reflux. And there's a common mistake of utilizing an ultrasound to make conclusions about presence of reflux or the severity of reflux. So things to remember about vesicular reflux is that it is a heterogeneous disease. So the non-dilating reflux is our kitten and the dilating reflux is our tiger. And there's a mistake in over treating the benign VUR and under treating the aggressive VUR. VUR does not cause UTI, bacteria does cause UTI. And the natural history of VUR is a resolution. Scarring is more with recurrent UTI, as we said, and by age four to six years, the parenchyma is less vulnerable to scarring. So our war against UTI is probably most fierce in the earlier years in terms of protecting renal function. And as the kids age beyond six years of age, our war still holds, but it's not as fierce war. Shall I give prophylactic uh, antibiotics? So before answering this question, I want you to ponder on the following uh, facts. Only 17% of your patients where you prescribe prophylaxis are actually taking the prophylaxis and they are compliant with that, only 17%. And many studies have shown emergence of resistant bacteria. There's increased risk of resistant infections by 7.5 times on patients on prophylaxis. Uh, is it safe to stop prophylaxis? Many studies have been done, and actually in kids with uh, uh, grade 3 VUR, stopping prophylaxis altogether increased febrile UTI, uh, did not increase febrile UTI. It was only found in 3% of the cohort with no new scars. What about probiotics? Probiotics are promising but there's no solid data on that. There's a Cochrane review in 2015 that looked into a meta-analysis of nine studies. However, only one pediatric study, there was low level of evidence, but there's some benefit that probiotics can help. And they usually help by boosting the immune response and by uh, uh, re-establishing uh, a more uh, prolific flora that will protect against uh, uh, Europathogens that can cause UTI. What about cranberries? The use of cranberry products does not appear to be associated with a significant reduction incidence of recurrent urinary tract infection. This was also a meta-analysis by 24 studies and they saw no clinical benefit. However, this study looked into all studies irrespective of the formulation of the cranberry. And many products of cranberry, they are just uh, uh, poor uh, extracts of cranberry because it has been shown that the response of, uh, of uh, bacterial adhesion to the urethelium is dose dependent. So if you give the anthrocyanidine, which is the active ingredient that prevents the adherence of bacteria to the urethelium, cranberry does uh, uh, does uh, cause uh, a good benefit, but then you're not giving cranberry, you're giving anthrocyanine. What about water? Water is very important. Uh, dilution is the solution to pollution, as I like to say. But again, it's only logical that water works. There is very scarce high level evidence to support its use. I was trying to look into the literature and I only came across one randomized clinical trial in 2018 and it's in women not in children that actually uh, shows that uh, water works and probably it works. I always advise my kids to drink lo lots of water 
not sugary uh, 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 juices and not carbonated beverages. We always have to keep in mind sexual abuse in a child with unexplained recurrent urine tract infections. We should have a high index of suspicion and some children uh, insert foreign bodies in their genitalia. And I can show you some of the x-rays and one cystoscopic uh, uh, image that shows lots of weird stuff that kids can insert in their uh, urethra or, or vagina. Radiation exposure in children. There is more public awareness and cautioning against increased risk of radiation. So in our management of recurrent febrile urinary tract infections or UTI, we have to keep in mind the increased risk of childhood cancers and future fertility. We are probably overutilizing some of the tests. So we have to always ask ourselves, is it indicated, is it necessary, and is there an alternative imaging? So in conclusion, we have to look into our pie, look into all the variables that I talked about, and first and foremost, do no harm, individualize your management, assess your risks, consider your cures, and you have to manage the risks. And uh, for that, I conclude, thank you very much for having me, and I'm ready to take your questions. And if you want to email me, you can freely do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yasser. It was an excellent uh, presentation. All of us learned a lot, a few points about uh, the incidence of uh, contamination in bag urine. We all know that, but still uh, I, almost everyone is a culprit when it comes to taking the shortcut. I mean, we do need to spend a little time and uh, really appreciate your sticking to time as well. So we have a reasonable time for discussion. Uh, there is one question about uh, the risk of scarring, whether it applies only to the high urinary tract infection or even cystitis can predispose in some cases. So what is your view on that? Uh, yeah, so basically scarring can, uh, can change the anatomy of, uh, of the renal parenchyma and might become inidus for, uh, for more adherence of bacteria. So uh, scarring can invite uh, mo more scarring and then it can be uh, a, a vicious cycle. But sometimes there are many other variables that we are not aware of. For example, some kids can have no scarring even with multiple infections where, where other kids can have significant scarring with a single infection. So uh, I'm sure there are more genetic things and more uh, uh, um, um, subtle anatomical differences that we need to un unravel. So this differentiation of upper and lower tract infections, I mean, would you focus on that part or it's not as? Yeah, so basically, basically, uh, usually a lower urinary tract infection, and this is basic uh, teaching of urology, lower urinary tract infection is usually non-febrile uh, and it is more with irritative urinary symptoms. And usually lower urinary tract infections uh, uh, poses less uh, risk to the kidneys. But again, because urine is an ascending infection, subsequent to a lower urinary tract infection is the risk of progress to an upper urinary tract infection. Uh, now, again, because we're dealing with children, uh, uh, we don't have like adults to care about prostatitis, for example, as in adults or uh, sexually transmitted diseases in the younger uh, age group, although adolescents may have sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, but in general, uh, upper urinary tract infections are more injurious and more risky than lower urinary tract. So the differentiation of the two, what are the clinical tips for that? Uh, fever fever and uh, basically uh, your good uh, clinical uh, history and, uh, and physical exam, uh, so, uh, uh, CVA tenderness is a sign of uh, a pyelonephritis. Again, if you do a CBC, uh, you'd probably find more uh, leukocytosis and left shift with, uh, with, a, with a febrile uh, pyelonephritis than with a lower urinary tract. History and physical exam is probably your best bet into that. There is one question about uh, 
ureteric injection may be at the uh, bladder insertion site versus treating the upper part i mean the dilated part so uh, is there any difference i mean is it related to ureterocele that you're talking of a uh, ureteric injection or is there any other role for it so so basically when you uh, you want to surgically manage uh, reflux you have the options of doing a minimally invasive injection of bulking agent to to prevent reflux versus the classical uh, ureteral reimplantation now there's lots of uh, a debate and 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 uh, points and counterpoints into that. Basically, uh, the gold standard cure of reflux is the gold standard uh, reimplantation. And now, with the advent of robotics and laparoscopy, you can do it with minimal invasion. Uh, however, it is attractive to do uh, the injections because there's no scarring. It's a day procedure. And it is successful in the low to moderate grade reflux. So if you have grade one to three reflux, you probably will have good results with the injections up to maybe 70 to 80%. Uh, but with high grade reflux or with complex anatomy, for example, duplication, urethroceles, etc., you'd probably go back to classical reimplantation. Now, the other thing that you can do since you mentioned urethroceles is uh, to endoscopically puncture the ure urethroceal to deflate it and to prevent its uh, obstructive uh, element on the, uh, on the drainage. And you can actually do that in some selected patients. Very interesting, the slide you showed about the uh, holding the urine and the dysfunctional uh, effect. So, I mean, the remedy for it is it to make the parents aware at an early stage so they start intervening before the child goes into the cycle. Uh, actually, it's one of the very challenging managements. It's because uh, the real, the real uh, uh, cure to that problem is the child himself or herself. As much as me as a clinician would spend time in the clinic uh, counseling or discussing, or as the parents, as much as the parents can talk to their child, if the child is holding his iPad and playing the video game, there's no power on earth that can move him. It's very challenging. There are a couple of more questions I would request you to look into the list and type the answers for those who have asked them. Because of the shortage of time, we have to close here. But really uh, useful talk for everyone and appreciate your contribution. Um,